Good afternoon. First, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to the session on liquidity phase separation. Today, I'm going to address the fundamental nature of protein condensates. As more and more proteins are being discovered to undergo liquid phase separation, it's also becoming more intriguing whether this is a property of distinguished set of classes of proteins, or instead, it is a general cellular mechanism which contributes to the organization and biological activities of cellular matter. If this is the case, then sequences of most proteins should include this property and we should be able to identify the sequence signatures biasing proteins to be part of condensates. In addition, we need to understand those molecular mechanisms which enable proteins to safely explore to be part of condensates and also identify those conditions when condensates become aberrant and lead to dysfunction. When we think about proteins, we mostly consider them in their native states. When they are present at low concentrations, where they are relatively free to diffuse. Consequently, their functions are independent on the sequences of other molecules. So we may put forward a deterministic relationship between intrinsic sequence properties of proteins and their biological functionalities. In their native states, proteins are either monomeric or from stoichiometric complexes. Therefore, function is determined by either intramolecular interactions, or I would say mostly intramolecular interactions, or by the distinguished set of intermolecular contacts which are established with a selected partner. Proteins may be fully ordered in their native state or can be conformationally heterogeneous and basically sample the whole continuum. In the cell, the situation is quite different because proteins are present at high concentrations and they are not free to diffuse. Therefore, their function is becoming dependent on the sequences of other molecules that may interfere with biological activities directly or generate stochastic signals or noise to interfere with function. Therefore, in the cell, it is the collective behavior of many different kinds of proteins that determine the biological activity. In the cell, proteins form non-stoichiometric assemblies which may sample a wide range of dynamics and material states from a solid-like amyloid state to a liquid-like droplet state and sampling the whole continuum with many different kinds of uh, signaling complexes. Function is determined by a collective behavior which is generated from both intra and intermolecular interactions and as you will see, these intermolecular interactions are much less defined than in case of stoichiometric assemblies. The native state of proteins is thermodynamically favored at low concentrations. However, at high concentrations, it is the amyloid state, which is the most stable one. The native state is still possible because of its kinetic accessibility, but it's not the most stable one anymore. So, under physiological conditions, proteins can sample three fundamental states, the native state, and two kinds of quantum states, the droplet state, which is liquid-like, and the amyloid state, which is solid-like. In order to describe this landscape, we need to consider both the intramolecular organization of proteins as well as their intermolecular organization. At low intermolecular order, at low concentration, the native state is separated by high barrier from the quantum states, which would be generated by a collective behavior. 
in contrast at high concentrations, these barriers for the collective behavior become lower. Therefore, the condensed states become possible. The droplet state, and in particular, the amyloid state are thermodynamically more stable than the native state. And obviously the droplet state can mature irreversibly into the amyloid state. Biological functions are possible in all these three states, but in very different way, very different molecular mechanisms. While in the native state, holding creates distinguished microenvironments that enable specific recognition or different kinds of chemical processes. In the condensed state, this kind of distinguished microenvironments are averaged out and functional effects are mostly consequences of local concentration changes. So when we think about protein functions in the cell, we need to consider a relationship between the state and function instead of a structure and function. So we need to replace the classical structure function paradigm by a state function paradigm. So the droplet state of proteins is a fundamental state along with the native and amyloid state. And under physiological condition, all these three states can be explored. Now the question is, what are the sequence codes for this droplet state? And if you look for specific patterns of amino acid residues, which are those that would go into the holy grail in order to account for the fact that most proteins should be able to sample the droplet state? And I would also ask for how exhaustively we need to do this search again to prove the generality of this phenomenon. Well, let's consider the general framework. So in order to exploit functionalities in the native state, then protein sequences should be evolved to minimize the population of the condensed states, in particular, the amyloid state. But at the same time, since these states are unavoidable, in particular under cellular conditions, they should be opportunistically exploited for different kinds of functionalities. So, in the, the, so protein sequences should be evolved to stabilize these native interactions favoring the native state and maybe minimize the population of these non-native interactions. Within the energy landscape framework, the, these kind of non-native interactions provide frustration to the native state at low concentrations. But at high concentrations, they basically stabilize the condensed state. And this should be exploited for all kinds of functionalities. We may better understand it using an analogy of a drone. So let's consider a protein sequence to be a drone which undergoes the training of evolution. For the intramolecular interactions, the partners are fairly well known because these are the other parts of the sequence. Therefore, the interactions which are evolved are very specific, and these are the native like interactions. But for the intramolecular interactions, in contrast, conditions are less clear, and the protein sequence has a limited knowledge on its partners because the partners may change abruptly, may change uh, very frequently under different cellular conditions. So these interactions are not specific, it should be generic interaction and non native one. If you look for these non native interactions, I and mean, we may find a zoo of names, a zoo of different kinds. If we do like multiple expansion, the electric field, obviously we find that high order terms are weaker. And people use quadrupole interactions, pi pi interactions, because it's weak enough, but probably they don't use octopole interactions because it doesn't have a name. So, anyway, this strategy is not really a universal one to collect more and more uh, 
types of uh, interactions. We should take a more generic approach. So we should find generic non-native interactions that can sample many binding configurations to provide a high entropy for the liquid light of that state. They should have weak specificity because condensates have uh, distinguished compositions of the variable. And in addition, these interactions should be adaptable to cellular conditions. Because droplets may be induced by a post-translational modification of a given type, or may be diminished by another kind of post-translational modification, or they may be induced in a given cellular compartment and not in the other. And this is a very complicated condition. This is what most people don't realize the difficulty of. So that means basically that the interaction notice should change with the cellular conditions. At present, I would say there is no model in the literature out that could explain all this. So we may need, again, a kind of general approach and a possibility is to exploit entropy for finding interaction motives. We know that disordered regions, which are often associated with the condensate, can have very different binding modes. They can undergo disorder to all the transition and form well-defined patterns in their complexes. And this change is uh, accompanied by negative entropy. At the same time, it is also possible that the disordered region remains disordered in the bound state and exhibits variable interaction patterns or even increased disorder, therefore increased entropy uh, upon binding. And many of those may exhibit so-called context-dependent interactions, so well-defined patterns under some conditions and variable patterns under other conditions. We know quite a lot about these uh, interaction modes. Adapting uh, this concept to the common state, we can say that the native state exploits both ordered and disordered interactions, but mostly ordered. In the condensed state, the amyloid state is uh, associated with ordered interaction, but the, the droplet state with disordered interactions. So in principle, if we look for disordered interactions and motifs and the interaction signs biasing for this disordered interaction, we should be able to find the, the motifs, the, the signatures for condensates. So how should we do that? Well, there is a considerable knowledge on these different binding modes and also the sequence codes that have been accumulated kind of, I would say, independently of the condensate field. And this initiative was started before the recognition of the, let's say, molecular mechanisms of condensates. So we have thousands of protein complexes well characterized along the spectrum of entropy from negative to positive entropy change combining and also the interaction patterns from well defined to more heterogeneous uh, patterns. So if we want to compute this, what we need to do is compute context dependence, basically determine whether there is a bias in a sequence that would bring the sequence towards the left or the right side of the spectrum. And what we need to do for this is to examine possible interaction motives and compare to their flanking sequences and see whether there is a bias. As you see here, there are only three parameters that we use. So you don't need a very complicated model. Here, the local dynamics, composition, and hydrophobicity was considered. As a result of this approach, you get a fairly detailed description on the dynamic interaction profile of a molecule, which is illustrated here with a signaling complex. So in this one, uh, a part, the consensus part of the interaction site, which is, is considered to be the concept of interaction mode, which is reasonably stable, but there is a very important secondary site, is very dynamic. Here, you can see that this second part has a moderate degree of ordering. So we can give on a continuous scale 
the degree of ordering upon binding. And what you get out of this analysis, in addition to the so-called binding mode that is dependent on the degree of ordering, so you can apply binary classification, but also this kind of continuous scale. You may also get information on the binding mode diversity of particular protein regions. That means whether they can vary their interaction modes between this ordered and ordered interaction which will be highly important when we will talk about aggregation and condensates. So using this approach, we may describe the interaction in condensates as disordered interactions. And for parameterizing a method, we used only one more term, which uh, was basically characteristics a measure of the disorder in the free state. So using this, two terms, we could identify regions which promote droplet formation. These are droplet promoting propensities, again, on a scale from zero to one. Uh, this is illustrated here with alpha synuclein, where the C-terminal region uh, promotes droplet formation. However, when you look for the droplet formation probability of a whole protein, not just the region, you need to consider that some proteins can form droplets standalone, whereas others may have droplet promoting regions, but require other proteins, some kind of induction to be part of condensates. These secondary ones are the clients. This kind of nucleation condensation, by the way, is a very general property of all higher order states. So how can we distinguish these two scenarios, drivers and clients? Well, here, in addition to these droplet promoting regions, we need to add some other factors. This is illustrated here with alpha synuclein and beta synuclein. So alpha synuclein can form droplets 20 degrees. Beta synuclein requires a bit of temperature increase in order to do that. And although both of them have a droplet promoting region. What beta synuclein misses is a hydrophobic patch in the middle that would provide additional stability of a droplet standalone. If we account for this effect, then we may distinguish between droplet formation probability of these two proteins and obviously many others. So in our method, the limit for droplet formation is this uh, 0.6. If you apply this methodology to the human proton, we find that about 40% of human proteins are capable to form droplets standalone, whereas 45% additionally can be induced to form droplets. The significance of these predictions are that basically it proves the principle that generic interactions, which bias for disordered interactions, many binding configurations, are responsible for droplet formation instead of some specific patterns. So basically using this model, we can see that the droplet state is indeed encoded by non-native disordered interactions, and these generic interactions are widespread in cells. What about aberrant condensates? Definitely, these non-native interactions may bring a risk. Many different kinds, aggregation, toxicity, promiscuous interactions, mislocalization, many, many others. All due to the fact that they are highly context dependent. These are non-native interactions. These can be induced under many different contexts. Out of these risks, I will detail the aggregation. Uh, aspect in this talk. If we compare properties of experimentally identified dopad promoting and amyloid promoting regions, we find amazing overlap between their properties regarding amino acid composition, regarding uh, amyloid promoting propensities by council or tango, or droplet promoting propensities. Obviously, there are some differences, but the overlap is amazing. 
That means that there should be some very delicate properties that we distinguish residues that bias for aggregation and those that, let's say, stabilize the droplet state. So let's consider our general framework again. So we have the native state, mostly with ordered, sometimes disordered interactions. And then when we convert the droplet state to the amyloid state, we basically move from disordered to ordered interaction. So basically what we do, we change the interaction mode. So how can we account for this change in the interaction mode? Let me illustrate this on the low complexity domain of TDP43. If we consider the interaction properties, the interaction behavior of different hypothetical regions, or basically involving all residues, under many different conditions, we find that they may sample both disordered interactions and ordered interactions. The population of the residues in disordered interactions is higher. Therefore, the low complexity domain forms a drop. But there is a low population that may also sample alternatively an ordered state. This may bias for aggregation. Now, the, the characterizing this distribution will tell us the likelihood to convert between these two states. We may use the Shannon entropy from the information theory that would basically tell us the likelihood to change between the two states. Let me illustrate this. We call it a droplet landscape approach. So on the x-axis, you see the droplet promoting propensity of residues, whereas on the y-axis, you see the likelihood to change the interaction modes. The residues that are sitting here, bottom right, they have very high droplet promoting propensity and very low shannon entropies, very low binding mode entropy. So they don't want to change their binding mode. They remain disordered binding. They remain in the droplet. The ones that are here have slightly lower droplet promoting propensity, but have considerably higher binding mode entropy. That means they tend to move from order, from disorder to ordered binding mode. And the ones here with light green, they are actually the ones that are part of the amyloid core of TDP43. So basically, this kind of approach would tell us that which residues tend to bias uh, the condensed uh, state for aggregation. So this is a concept we put forward and we thought to quantify it, we, we thought to apply it for predictions. Basically, this would explain why fibrous grow really gradually. So it's not an immediate uh, process, right? You have liquid drop upon familiar mutations, you have liquid droplets for a while, and they gradually start to fibrilize. They are gradually shifted towards more ordered binding modes. So what we did was we took experiments from the Mayan lab on pass, single mutations, some are associated with the ALS, some not, which were systematically studied with respect to their impact on aggregation propensities. So we parameterized a method using these mutants and applied to all known ALS mutations that were experimentally identified to change aggregation propensities. So we use here only three parameters, the aggregation propensity, droplet promoting propensity, and this kind of change in the binding modes. These three parameters would distinguish, as you see, ALS mutations and their impact on aggregation propensity from non-ALS mutations. We really hope that as more data become available, we can make the method even more precise and we can use it to identify hotspots for aggregations within condensates. So this kind of condensation pathway, droplet maturation, is basically driven by mutations which are capable to switch between disordered and ordered interaction modes 
And the familial mutations associated with ALS, for example, they basically broaden the spectrum of these interaction modes and facilitate the switch from disorder to order interaction, often not really increasing the aggregation propensities per se. So the take home message of this talk is that phase separation, formation of protein condensates is a general cellular phenomenon. And we have the exciting challenge to formulate the state function paradigm based on generic interactions. Most of this work was done in a beautiful city of Padua. This is the room uh, where Galilei was teaching. Uh, this is my new email address. In case you want to ask more questions, then uh, that can be asked in the allocated time. Most of this work was done in collaboration between Caleb and Roscoe in Cambridge and his crew and some conceptual uh, work uh, preparing this work was done together with Hao Wu. Uh, with Peter Bolanes and the team from Buenos Aires, we, we formulated energetic uh, formalists for these disordered interactions. And um, uh, Chabon wrote the server uh, of Pastro, which we are most welcome to try. And there are undergoing projects in Padova uh, which will give more in-depth characterization into the structure and treated characteristics of these disordered interactions. Thank you very much for your attention.